love your work. On this show, we help you find success on your own terms. I'm David Cadavy. I've been an independent creator for more than 10 years, written a couple of best-selling books, Designed for Hackers, Now the Heart to Start. If you are new here, welcome. Again, I'm David Cadavy. If you want to join us here on Love Your Work every Thursday, please hit subscribe on your podcast app. Regular listeners know that I recently self-published for the first time. In the process of self-publishing, I have discovered a whole new world. I used to think that self-publishing would be a step down for me. After all, I had a traditional publisher for my first book. It was nice to have the vote of confidence and the advance check from the publisher. And it was nice to have the support on editing, design, and distribution. But it turns out that there's more and more opportunity in self-publishing. You have full control over your writing and you're going to be responsible for most of your marketing anyway. So you actually have more control over that marketing as a self-published author. And it turns out there are more six-figure authors than ever. There was a recent survey from Written Word Media, and it found that in 2017, the number of authors making $100,000 or more jumped by 70%. That's a lot. Our guest today is one of the leaders in helping self-published, or I should say, indie authors find their way, Joanna Penn has been self-publishing since 2009. She's written 27 books under three different pen names, and she earns a multi-six-figure income. She writes about writing and running an indie author business at thecreativepen.com, and she also has a fantastic podcast called The Creative Pen. So in this episode, you're going to learn why is self-published the wrong term? I keep saying self-publishing, and I'll probably keep saying it, but Joanna prefers the term indie author. Now, why is that? And how can you hit the New York Times bestseller list as an indie author? Joanna has done it. She's going to explain why she thinks it's not such a big deal. And why have pen names? As I said, Joanna publishes under three different pen names, which I think is very cool. And it's an interesting way to break down creative resistance. But I was surprised to hear why she really does it. And this is another sponsor-free episode. I have to say there's something I kind of enjoy about not having sponsors because it's less to manage. It lets me focus on putting together the episode and then doing more writing outside of working on the podcast. But it does take money to make this show. Fortunately, about half of production expenses are covered by our Patreon supporters. If you want to join them, if you want to listen to this podcast, knowing that you are helping make it happen for thousands of people, please donate. You'll get early access to episodes and other cool things on your custom RSS feed. Learn more at kadavy.net slash donate. That's kadavy.net slash donate. Here is Joanna Penn. I am here with Joanna Penn. And Joanna, we were just chatting before the show and um, you said self-published versus indie. So I'm wondering what is the difference in your mind between a self-published author versus an indie author? Oh, well, thanks for having me on the show, David, for a start. I I love talking about this stuff. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest difference, I I just don't like the term self-publishing because when you are a professional independent author, you don't do everything yourself. So the word self is kind of, um, is just wrong. So I work with professional Mm. editors. So I work with content editors, line editors, proofreaders. I work with professional cover designers. I work with professional website people. You know, I do a lot of my own marketing, but you know, like you, I have a podcast and I work with a professional sound guy. Um, You know, I have transcriptionists. I have about 17 contractors that I work with in my uh, my creative business, which is based on writing books. So I think when people start out and you know might want to put their first book out there, or if it's a, a project of the heart uh, or a project that's not designed for the basis of a business, <laughs> then self-publishing might be the right word. But independent author just means someone who is not owned by one of the big publishing companies, many of which are owned by some of the biggest media companies in the world. Uh, so I think that's 
that's really important. And and the sort of the word independent is similar to indie filmmakers, indie musicians, uh, you know, even things like small batch breweries in the US, uh, you know, really taking off uh, independent creators, you know, on YouTube, that type of thing. So for me, it's part of a movement, part of a sort of taking control of your creative life and putting yourself into the world without um, middlemen, basically. I'm glad you brought up music because as you were talking about that, it made me think about music and how kind of like the early 2000s or so there was this, or at least in my mind, that's when there was a big indie music explosion. And I I saw something the other day that was advertising, oh, these are indie musicians, but they, they, as far as I knew, they weren't from, you know, small labels. Like it, be, it had become a, a style of, of music in a, in a way. So it kind of makes you wonder, uh, I guess with the case of indie authors, um, at, at some point, does an indie author get so successful that they're no longer uh, indie? Well, I think uh, there is a, a genre of music, uh, you know, indie music back in the, I think it was the 90s, you know, originally. But the, the word independent just really means that you haven't, you you own and control your intellectual property assets. So Mm -hmm. when you sign with a publisher, you are basically licensing your intellectual property rights to a company. And most authors, um, many authors don't really look at their contracts, but if they did, uh, then you would see that you're essentially most of the time licensing, say, world English rights in all formats, all territories uh, to that company. So, you know, that company might be a massive conglomerate uh, rather than being independent where you can do what you like. So for me, I all, you know, I love the control and ownership of intellectual property assets as the fundamental basis to my business. Uh, I love the speed to market, the higher royalties, the fact that I don't have to ask permission for anything. So as soon as a new territory opens up, so I know you're you're in Colombia, you know, Latin America is, you know, really open to what's happening in the digital space. China, for example, uh, Eastern Europe's opening up to the digital world, which, you know, has started in America, but now is moving out to the rest of the world. Um, uh, All over the world, outside of the US, things are happening, even just in English. India, for example, another great market. I can just jump into those markets because I own my rights. So I think that's the big definition difference. Do you own and control your intellectual property rights? In which case, yes, yes, you are an independent author. Um, Or have you, you know, have you sold them or licensed them to a publisher? And there's nothing, obviously, there's nothing wrong with either way. It's more of what is your definition of success? And I think that is probably the most important question. And when it comes down to it, you know, if you're deciding which way to publish, that's the question to answer. I'm surprised to hear you say that uh, maybe a lot of authors don't look at their um, their publishing contracts. If, if anybody out there is listening and they have a, a publishing contract in front of them, they should definitely look at it. They should definitely have a lawyer look at it. I know that uh, I did, and I'm, I'm glad that I did because there were a number of things in there that it would have been really bad if I had just gone ahead and signed the contract. Uh, one of those being motion picture rights for my book, which could loosely have been interpreted as now that I have a, a, uh, a video course based upon my book that, that could loosely have been interpreted as me violating those rights. Another one was right of first refusal for my next piece of my next piece of work, which would have just complicated things a lot. So I was free because I struck that part of my contract to be able to go ahead and self-publish or indie publish uh, without too much of a problem. And that's interesting about the other markets. Uh, I, I want get, to get to that in a bit. But I guess one of my most compelling questions in my mind was that you are a New York Times best-selling author. And uh, I'll go ahead and use the dirty word again, self-published, but I'll, okay, indie, indie author. I, I, I had always thought like, oh, it's impossible to become a New York Times best-selling author when you are indie. How did that work? Well, there's actually quite a lot of uh, indie authors who've hit the New York Times and regularly on the USA Today list, Wall Street Journal list, Amazon charts. uh, One of you know, if you look at the big top selling authors um, in Britain and America, many of them are independent authors. Many of them, like me, have our own small presses. So uh, I have Curl Up Press. You have your own press, I think, um, as well. You know, we don't necessarily just put our name (laughs) on the uh, publisher. One really big one. 
that's my company name. It's just Cadavy Inc. Yeah. So not super creative. <laughs> I, I could always change it someday, I guess. But it was just like, that was what came to my mind when I was filling out the form on KDP. So Yeah, well, I think it's interesting, first of all, because most authors are not known by the publisher. So when you search on, uh, search for a book, you don't look for the latest Random House book. The, the mm-hmm. actual publisher name is something that authors care about far more than readers. So a book like um, The Martian by Andy Weir, that was self-published. Fifty Shades of Grey, that was self-published before they then got bought uh, to other things. Um, the Rabbit Who Wouldn't Go to Sleep, that was a massive create space, um, self-published hit uh, and again got, got bought. So lots of examples of that. So in terms of the New York Times list, to be specific, again, it kind of depends on your definition of success. So uh, when I first went indie and we can talk about that later, but, you know, I, I chose to do this for a living. Like I wanted to make money with my writing. That was a big thing for me. So hitting a list can be for some people, a definition of success. And, uh, what I would say to people is it is a game. The New York times particularly is a game and all the publishers play the game. <laughs> so, um, and when I hit the list back in oh, 2014, I think it was, uh, it was, uh, we played the game. So back then they actually had a digital list and they have changed it since then. So you can't actually hit oh, the okay. list that I hit back then. It was actually a combined print and ebook list and 12 of us got together. So whether you call it an anthology or a box set, we basically 12 authors got together and did a massive promotional campaign. So when 12 professionals with email lists get together and do promotion, uh, you can do very well. We used paid advertising like these days, uh, you know, or probably what's more interesting in the same thing that I did was hitting the USA Today list in 2016 on my own. Uh, both of these campaigns were sort of a, a combination of BookBub ads. BookBub.com is the is sort of biggest paid email list uh, promotional site for books. Uh, Facebook ads, email lists, and obviously using a product that people want. So in that New York Times run, it was uh, 12 books in one file. Uh, so one ebook box set with 12 novels in. And um, when I hit the USA Today, it was three novels. Um, actually, amusingly, those books had been out five years. So you don't even have to do it with a brand new book. Um, but basically for both of those runs on the charts, and you kind of have to look at it as I am doing a promotional campaign in order to hit the list, uh, then you have to um, do what's called ad stacking, which is essentially get multiple ad campaigns running at the same time, and then try and get those sales on the different stores. So just a few tips, you can't hit the New York Times or the USA Today with only sales on Amazon, which is why Amazon now has their own charts. So if you go, if you just Google Amazon charts, you'll see, and amusingly, Amazon particularly did this in order to say, you know, this is the only list based on sales, (laughs) overall sales. Mm -hmm. So a book might sell 200,000 copies on Amazon and still not hit the New York Times. And, you know, you can sell, what did we sell? We sold 110,000 copies in two weeks. And we were two weeks on the New York Times and seven weeks USA Today. And then I was on the USA Today, I think two weeks on my own. So, and the USA Today run I did, uh, I only sold 8,000 copies in a week. So these, you know, the, the type of numbers are interesting, but the Amazon charts, I think, is actually the best one these days because that's the one you will be selling a ton of books on, uh, whereas the other ones can be gamed. So the New York Times particularly has certain bookstores around the US that are reporting stores. And if you really, really want to hit the list, there are you know plenty of companies that will help you buy books in those stores, um, which is basically what a lot of publishers do. So I would say, again, sort of circling back to definition of success, and this is so important, is, okay, how much do you really care about hitting a list? Or is it about, say, serving your existing audience, your podcast audience, people who've bought your previous books? Do you want to actually make money? Because when you do a promotional run, you'll have to pay a lot in terms of promotional advertising. And you might only break even uh, on your promotion. Do you just want those letters after your name? Uh, you know, what are the reasons that you want to do these things? And then is it really worth it? Yeah, I'm glad that you're bringing that up because, you know, I myself 
had a decently successful first book and I was thinking, oh, my next book has got to be like a New York Times bestseller or something. And eventually I just ended up letting that go. Just the more that I've learned about getting on the list, what does it do for somebody? Some of the companies that you were talking about that will kind of go around and buy books at physical retail stores to help you get on the list. Like that costs from what I've heard around $200,000 or something like that. And then there's, there's the question like, what does it do for you? Yeah, you know, if you, if you want to be a speaker or you are a consultant or something, it might, it might help you with your back end business. Uh, how has it helped you, uh, hitting the New York Times list or the USA T- Today list? Uh, I, I really, I just did it because it was a game and I wanted to play the game. <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I mean, I think the USA Today, I kind of just wanted to prove a point that you could do this with older books as an, mm-hmm. as an individual author. And overall it cost me about, I think it was about $500. Um, it cost, wow. so it, it, uh, I spent about four and a half thousand and I made about 4,000 in that period. So, you know, uh, that was just proving a point. And then I was just, you know, I was invited into the run back in 2014 for the New York Times. So it wasn't a massive investment for me. I certainly didn't spend anything like what what you were talking about. So you don't have to do that. That is more of the print list uh, if you want to do that. But I think, you know, w- we should really just come back to what is the important thing. And to me, the lists mean nothing these days. And in fact, you know, the Amazon bestseller, pretty much anyone who can be an Amazon bestseller and you get that little yellow banner. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, bestselling books now are to a penny. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of books coming out all the time. And I personally believe everyone should write a book. I think we need more and more books and we're a self-sustaining industry (laughs) because of that, because everyone who writes a book will read far more books than they will ever write. So this is my kind of methodology for changing the world. (laughs) is, you know, get everyone to write a book because then everyone will read at least 20, 50, 100 books. Um, But basically, you again, coming back to what do you want? So what's more important? I never, ever had a goal to hit the list. I mean, I thought that might be nice, but I'm also in Britain. So in Britain, our lists are completely sewn up. They're not at all about sales. So you can't hit a list in Britain um, as an independent author. They're completely you know, ring fenced for traditional publishers, Uh, whereas America is slightly more egalitarian. But for me, it was always about making a living and and making a multi six figure living. So that's why I, you know, partly I write because I make a living that way, but also I write because I can't not write. (laughs) And I've got, Mm -hmm. you know, 27 books right now. Um, I never had a goal to win a literary prize, um, but I'm now award nominated, you know, but if you have a goal to win a literary prize, then you'd be better off traditionally publishing because most of those prizes are also um, very directed at traditional publishers. And most of them have a very high entry uh, fee into them. Uh, Many people might not realize that, but you know, many of these prizes are funded by the entry fees <laughs> of the publishers who put books in them. So th- these are the things, there are lots of myths and lots of things that go on behind the curtain of publishing. And I think once you get into it, like, as I said, you know, 27 books later, the publishing aspect of my business is minuscule. It takes me a couple of hours to publish a book. Uh, the time that I spend is in writing and marketing. And you have to do those things however you choose to publish. It's just, I make 70% royalty (laughs) on my books. Whereas, you know, a traditionally published author might make 10% up to 25%. Yeah, I had a conversation with Seth Godin several months back that really helped me break through my own resistance to uh, self-publishing using the dirty word again, um, which was basically that you're still going to be head of marketing for your book, no matter what. And in fact, in, in, um, in marketing my new book, the Heart to start, I have learned things about marketing that I never would have learned traditionally publishing that I certainly didn't learn with my first traditional publishing, um, and endeavor. And in fact, some of those things have been things that I've learned in the process of marketing this book that have then helped me uh, sort of revive or reoptimize my first book, Design for Hackers. One of those examples just being that I, I, I realized that uh, my publisher had attached, you can attach these back end keywords uh, to books on Amazon for, for those who are listening. 
And so they had added these keywords that were just not appropriate at all. Uh, one of them was reverse engineering. And because I think because of that, I ended up getting a one-star review from somebody who was complaining that my book, Design for Hackers, Reverse Engineering Beauty, was not a good book about reverse engineering. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can see why that went wrong. <laughs> yeah, and I, had, and I had no way of knowing that those keywords were wrong um, because I just didn't know about these back-end keywords and that I could just call Author Central and have them change. I mean, I actually have to work with my publisher to change those keywords, but at least in the case of, um, well, I, I guess in, in some editions, sometimes it's possible to call Author Central and change the keywords, but then there's a feed coming from the traditional publisher that ends up overriding it or something like that. So there's plenty of stuff to be learned about marketing and you're going to have to do the marketing anyway. And there's something nice about being responsible for it because then you're accountable and then you actually learn more that way, I find. Yeah. And also, I think the keywords is a good example because they change all the time. So, uh, you know, not to get too technical, but you enter these keywords in on the sort of the back end publishing engine, um, you know, on KDP or whether you're on Kobo or iBooks or any of these other sites. And they kind of populate. So when people search, as you said, they come up, but they can also put you in subcategories. So, for example, I write um, conspiracy thrillers and you can get into subcategory conspiracy thriller with a keyword. But then Amazon are always changing their algorithms, but they're also always changing their subcategories. So mm. your keywords that you put on a publication will not stay the same. So I'm updating my keywords on my books, you know, a couple of times a year as new keywords, new search terms become more important. And that is the control aspect. It's being able to change it and be, you know, that will be uploaded within four hours and sometimes even quicker. Or for example, changing a book cover or fixing a typo, um, that kind of control over your file. Or, you know, when you write more books, you change the back, back matter, or you want to add in a link back to your website to sign up for your email list. Uh, all these things you can do and just upload a new file. And if people are worried, formatting is very, very easy now. I use a software called Vellum, which is just fantastic. It makes formatting completely fun, uh, which I never thought I would say because <laughs> it doesn't sound <laughs> fun. But all of those things, like you say, that control, that ability, to change things. Um, so I'm just coming up to 10 year anniversary on my first nonfiction book, Career Change, and I'm updating it for the 10 years. And, you know, all I'll need to do is just upload another file, upload a new cover, and, uh, you know, that will just carry on. So this sort of long term control. And I mean, I don't want to rag on traditional publishers because they're amazing people working in traditional publishers. But the other issue is skin in the game. So you would have worked with an editor and you might have, you know, you would have worked with a cover designer or they would have assigned you one, all of whom are paid a salary from that publishing company. None of those people actually have skin in your game. Their job is not not to make a percentage on what you sell. Whereas when you're selling it yourself, <laughs> you have the ultimate skin in the game. You absolutely care about your product and you care about it all the time. So a publisher will have hundreds, thousands of books in their backlist. They are not going to go back to your book a year later and update keywords <laughs> unless you're selling really well. I'm sure they do it for like Lee Child and people like that, um, you know, but they won't do it for most authors. Um, that's something that you, you know, you would have to remind them to do yourself because they can't look at all of their backlist right now. I mean, maybe they will once machine learning. And I know you've looked at some of this technology, uh, you know, this stuff, AI will start to come online. But I also think that AIs will mean there will be more books written by AI. So we're, we're in this really interesting world right now where the technology is enabling independent authors to make a living. And we can do absolutely everything. We can do audio books through ACX. We can do print on demand, um, you know, through CreateSpace, Ingram Spark, who are who we, and Ingram are used by the biggest publishers in the world. You know, uh, there's lots, we can pretty much do everything. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy. So yeah, you have to decide again, do you want to give up that control in exchange for whatever percentage? Uh, or do you want to keep that control yourself and upskill? And I would say like your, a lot of your audience are entrepreneurs and you interview a lot of entrepreneurs. So learning new skills is part of the job description. <laughs> so to me, this is a skill that you master a bit like say WordPress, uh, another skill that most, um, 
you know, most online creatives have to learn how to use WordPress. This is a bit like that. Once you learn how to do it, it becomes a functional part of your job as opposed to the fun bit, the creative bit, um, you know, that type of thing. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned all the different skills because that was something that I discovered in the process of doing the self-publishing was I realized like, oh, I've been building all these skills over the last 10 years being independent. Okay, I, I know how to do the writing. That's an obvious thing that you need to be able to do. I, I, some of the marketing, some of the search engine or Amazon is, is, is a search engine. And so there's SEO stuff going on there. Uh, I did all the layout. I coded it in HTML for the, the Kindle version on a, a program called Sigil. I did all the page layout. I'm trained as a graphic designer. I did all that on InDesign. Um, I recorded the audiobook myself uh, in my own sound studio and had already practiced reading articles on my podcast and everything. So it was really great to be able to exercise all those different skills because I'm a person who really likes to learn a lot of different things. I know a lot of my listeners are the same way because I certainly get a lot of people uh, maybe fretting to me that, ah, you know, I just have so many different interests and they're disparate interests. So, uh, Indie publishing is one of these things that you can that you can do where you can really use all of your different skills and build on those skills and and learn so many different things and make a living doing so. It's really wonderful. It is. I would say to people though listening, I mean, I don't do most of that myself. So I Yeah, you don't have yeah, to, obviously. I think that's really important. So I I pay cover designers. I do my formatting because it's just so easy. So, I mean, you don't need to be a coder. I know you're it's quite technical, but you don't have to be a coder to do um, formatting. It's a bit like Microsoft Word now or Kindle has uh, Kindle Create, their own tool for, um, you know, for Amazon. Uh, you know, you can work with a lot of professionals. What's so interesting, actually, with the publishing side is a couple of years ago, um, it's still going on. There's a lot of uh, upheaval in the publishing industry. A lot of people laid off as different um, imprints are sold to bigger and bigger companies, you know, the sort of conglomerate model um, that we're used to seeing. So a lot of professionals laid off. So most of the professional editors, cover designers, formatters, book designers um, that most self-publishers or independent authors use uh, have been working for traditional publishers over the years. So the level of uh, professional that you can work with now is exactly the same. Uh, I, I, you know, I have a friend whose cover designer is the same as Stephen King's. <laughs> you know, you've, <laughs> you've basically got access to these people now because so many of the publishing companies went to a freelance model as well. And often people will love to work with independents because most of these designers are also in Independence as well. Yeah, there's all this talent that's out there because I mean the model is changing so much. I mean it's unfortunate for these for these people that are out of their jobs or, or, or whatever. But the the big five publishing publishers, their market share just keeps on dropping, and the indie author market share keeps on keeps on growing. So um, it's just the industry is is definitely changing. Like I mean we've heard about this for the last 15 years, it feels to me like things are, I'm, I'm talking to a lot more um, traditionally published authors who are saying, I'm definitely self-publishing my next book. Yeah. And I, and partly that's because m many of them are not making enough money anymore. And that is very similar to, let's take the music model or the film model. So a few, not that long ago, there were only a few channels where you would watch TV, right? In our lifetime, we're talking, you know, when I was mm -hmm. growing up, you would watch what everyone else was watching. And it's the same in the book industry. Everybody used to read the books that they were told to read. And now, in the same way that we have Netflix, we have Amazon Prime, we have, you know, Hulu, we have uh, all the other network channels for TV. So you can segment down into things that you're going to watch. And generally, the conversation is not about one big thing, although obviously we've had it with Game of Thrones and things like that. But most people are listening to different podcasts, they're watching different shows, they're reading different books. And that ultra segmentation 
of content. I mean, YouTube's another great example. Uh, you have some big YouTubers, but most people are kind of in these weird corners of the internet with, you know, finding different people. And that's what's happened with books. So I was at into a thriller fest last year and in New York, uh, the International Thriller Writers Association. And there was a, a report done and they said, what's interesting is most people now will not have heard of the authors on the New York Times list. So it used to be that hitting the New York Times list was a reason to control the conversation. And that's again, why sort of circling back, it's not that important anymore because uh, readers find books in different ways. You know, they might, for example, podcasting, I find so many nonfiction books, particularly from listening to podcasts. I'm sure you do as well, right? You hear mm -hmm, or you yeah. interview someone or you hear an interview and you're like, oh, I'm going to buy their book um, because I'm interested in, in their take on things. So you go straight onto Amazon and find it, which is why podcasts can really shift books like Tim Ferriss, you know, will mention a book and <laughs> it sells gazillions. So the Tim Ferriss effect. Yeah, yeah. the Tim Ferriss effect. And this is the power of, of an audience of building your, your own audience. And and um, yeah, so I think this ultra segmentation is the reason why so many traditionally published authors have seen their incomes drop and how indie authors who, let's face it, we can write at speed and the creation of the book might take a similar amount of time to a traditionally published author, but because we don't have to wait uh, for the editors, for the agents, for the publisher to put you on the schedule. Like I know traditionally published authors who've written a book and it's been, it hasn't come out for another year after oh, they've okay. finished. I mean, that's quite normal. Or even with people's first book, they finish it, then they spend a year getting an agent, then they spend another year waiting for the deal. So in that time, you know, one of the reasons I went indie in the first place was I discovered how long it would take for my book to come to market. And I was like, no way, that's ridiculous. I can just upload it and start selling it this afternoon. <laughs> so that's another reason why indies can make more money is because we can put books out faster, uh, you know, rather than having to wait for somebody else's schedule where there are other people in the queue in front of you. <laughs> I mean, obviously there's pros and cons, but that speed to market and the ability to put more books out in smaller micro niches in the same way that you know, YouTube or music or TV or whatever, uh, do. And that is a, a huge part of, of making a living. Yeah. That was a huge motivation for me was that I had spent, I spent quite a bit of time finding the right book idea and doing the positioning and stuff, but actually the writing of the book really only took maybe a total of a, a couple of months or so. And, and, and as I was looking at traditionally publishing, um, it just seemed like that timeline was going to be so long. Again, also what you were saying about, um, sort of market segmentation. I really felt that pressure when I was going for traditionally published deals because I really felt this pressure to kind of go with these authority triggers uh, as an author that I don't, that aren't me and that I don't even see as authority triggers, like these ideas that, oh, you've got to be a, you know, a Stanford PhD. You've got to be some business consultant with a lot of experience in this exact same thing. But I'm somebody who likes to find my own path. And so, uh, independent publishing allowed me to go ahead and address a potentially smaller market and get it out quickly. And uh, it's it's been a, a fantastic experience. Now, I will say, I'm very jealous that it sounded like you didn't really have to let go of any ego to go ahead and independently publish. Is that accurate? <laughs> let go. Well, I think you need a healthy dose of ego to want to put your books into the world. <laughs> So well, we all have ego. Say, well, yeah, well, no, I mean, yes, we all do, but I, th I think it can come in different forms. Yeah, there's the ego of like, hey, I have something to say, I'm going to publish it. But then there's also the ego of, there's also the, the ego will hold you back in a, if I'm going to write a book, if I'm going to put through, go through all this work, it's got to be good so that my family and friends and myself will believe that. I am a, a worthy person, you know, like <laughs> these sort of things. And then this idea that, oh, I need to be a New York Times bestseller when you don't really necessarily understand what that means or why that would be a goal that you would want to have. And if you did know, you would probably change your mind. So I think that it's something that holds a lot of people back. I mean, I remember reading an article the other day from somebody in the Atlantic and she was saying she's been trying to get a book deal for 10 years and she has books that are written already. And it's just, it was just so sad to see that she wouldn't just like, let it go, 
put these books out there, you won't learn anything until you do it. Um, mm. and it well, I think did that, you struggle with any of that? Well, I think, again, it comes back to definition of success. So when I wrote my first book, I was working, uh, implementing accounts payable at a large mining company <laughs> in Australia, which, yeah. you know, it was like the least creative thing possible. And I got to the point of like crying at work. I was so miserable in my job, my very highly paid consulting job, um, that basically I... I want my definition of success was to change my career and become Mm -hmm. a full time writer. So I, you know, I was making six figures. And so I was not willing to become a writer unless there was a way I was going to be able to get back to the same level of income. Uh, And now I make far more than that. But, you know, it's taken 10 years to, to make that shift. But my, so my definition of success was never. Uh, somebody patting me on the back from Random House. Uh, although I know that is for many people what they ultimately want. So for me, the validation and this this validation is huge, uh, and and I do come up against it when I go to literary festivals and I speak at a lot of events. Um, and so, you know, people will kind of look at me in this way and like and treat me as second class citizen, even though I'm making. Mm. I mean, there most authors have a day job. You know, I actually earn. I'm in the top 1% of authors, you know, it's kind of crazy with uh, many of my friends are as well, because we are driven by creativity, but also by income. So I think that's really important. I was, I have been a businesswoman running my own business for, well, nearly 20 years at this point. Um, Not in all of that in writing, but I know how to run a business. So I think that was That was a really important point uh, for me. However, I went to Oxford University. You know, my mum was an English literature professor, um, not professor, teacher. And when I showed her my first novel, she said, why don't you write something nice like Hilary Mantel, who won the Booker Prize for Wolf Hall? (laughs) So, and I still remember that. I'm like, mum, I'm I'm not aiming to win the Booker Prize. (laughs) I mean, this is the thing. So again, it really comes down to why are you writing? You know, do you love writing so much you're going to do it, whatever? And that woman in the Atlantic, presumably she loves writing so much that she's writing all these books, but she also needs this validation of somebody telling her she's good. But if you, for example, if you decide to use a professional editor and you do the best product you can, you put the best cover on it, you put it out in the world and then see what readers think. So to me, the validation these days are readers and reviews and money in your bank account. (laughs) These are validation. And the problem is if you haven't put a book out yet, you are very scared about it. And I mean, I still get scared because of my fiction, particularly I put myself out there in a big way. And I have, I have written a book on the successful author mindset and, um, you know, self doubt is chapter one. And I think validation is chapter two. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone has these issues, but again, you have to keep coming back to like, what do you want? to do with your life you know and I know you moved to Columbia as part of it was what what did you want to do with your life and what was important and to be to be a writer you know you have to be somewhere that you can afford to live well and also have that type of community yeah and it's just like you were saying if you haven't put a book out there it's really hard to know what it's like and it can be so scary it can be this huge woolly mammoth I, I think of it like as if somebody told you, hey, you are able, you can walk through that wall, but you have to like just run at it head first and you will go straight through it. And you have to have the confidence <laughs> to be able to, to do that. And it is super frightening, but everything changes the moment that you do put something out there, um, which kind of segs into something else I'm curious about, which is that you publish under pen, different pen names. Now, I imagine that has kind of a marketing purpose, but uh, I can see how pen names can also help people overcome some of that resistance of of putting their work out there. Is there any element of that in in your use of different pen names? Uh, well, yeah. So I run, I, I do nonfiction as Joanna Penn and then thrillers as JF Penn. And then I now co-write Sweet Romance with my mum <laughs> and we write yeah. under Penny Appleton. That is the same mum who wanted me to be Hilary Mantel. So she's now writing too. But yeah, I started uh, writing nonfiction. And then when I started writing thrillers, what I quickly discovered is that I needed a separate website because it's m- mainly it's the promise to the reader. 
So you're interviewing Joanna Penn. <laughs> um, and Joanna Penn is a kind of self-help, um, sort of introvert Tony Robbins type character. You know, my whole aim is to help creatives get their book into the world. That's kind of what I do under Joanna Penn. JF Penn is a completely different side of me. It's the shadow side. It's, uh, you know, she rarely is interviewed. It's my dark side. My books are very dark, um, uh, you know, a lot of death. Uh, and so the promise to the reader between those two names, it's so important that people who buy a Joanna Penn book don't get that darkness that a reader of JF Penn thrillers will like. Now, some people overlap. But between those three brands, you know, there are very few people who would overlap between the three. The other thing is um, segmentation in an era of machine learning and algorithms. So this is even more hyper important right now. So, you know, those emails that people get, um, people who, you know, you bought this, you might also like that. And the Mm -hmm. Amazon page on your Kindle or the homepage is going to change depending on what you have bought even five minutes ago. So what I want to teach the algorithm is people who buy Joanna Penn books are this type of person. So when I put out another book under Joanna Penn, Amazon will automatically serve those books to people who read books like that. And you will see this in the also boughts. So if you look at um, how to market a book, for example, by Joanna Penn, in the also boughts, you're going to see lots of books that are aimed at writers. If you go and do the same on a JF Penn book, like Stone of Fire, for example, you'll see completely different also boughts. So partly those are populated, you know, those are populated when people buy books, but also with Amazon advertising. So from a marketing level, you can even set automatic targeting uh, with Amazon ads. And that works best when you have very clearly defined audiences. Then also I have different websites, different branding, different email lists, uh, different social media. Uh, I don't recommend doing three different names because it's really hard work, Um, but I actually love it. Um, And I even, I know you're into time scheduling. Um, I schedule my time by brand. So this is a Joanna Penn time slot, but between like 7 a.m. and 9.30 in the morning, uh, I'm at the cafe as JF Penn. So I kind of schedule my time around creating these different aspects. And so it works on a creative level. It helps the reader and it helps the business models because like Joanna Penn, I have a business model of online courses, for example. But for JF Penn, my thrillers, the business model is book sales. So that's why I have so many novels in series. It's because the income for JF Penn is around that. It's also around, um, you know, you mentioned film rights. I've just adapted Map of Shadows to a screenplay. Uh, That's Mm. a a dark fantasy novel. So there's different um, business models, different readers, different segmentation. It, It just makes sense if you're writing very different books. I, I love the observation about machine learning. That's 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 really interesting. I think that'll obviously be more and more intense as time goes on. But I think this is something that I, I want to point out to the listeners that I think that I didn't really understand until I hit publish on KDP. And this was something that Seth Godin even said in our conversation was, you know, I if I were just starting out, I would publish a book a week do it under a different name if you want. And that's something that I did was that there's all these, there's these little technical things that maybe you don't know about before you publish your first book. You can seriously go onto KDP and upload 500 words of whatever you want under any name you want and at least go through the process of publishing something. You can then run ads on it if you want. And you can learn so much from that that would help you in your first book. And it also kind of helps I find the pen name thing helps resistance. I know there was a there's a pen name that I wrote an online dating advice blog on under like 10 years ago or something like that. I was making a lot of money from that. But part of it was just like I didn't really want to publish that stuff under my under my real name. Now I don't mind people knowing about it. But um it can be a way to get over that emotional barrier as well to actually getting your work out there. Yeah. And I think uh, book length is also really important. Um, I don't put out a book a week, (laughs) um, but I know people who put out one a month, you know, who put out, um, you know, like romance authors, for example, a romance novel can be 50,000 words, Uh, but many authors are putting out novellas. So that's about 25 to 
30,000 words. For nonfiction, I mean, Seth did it himself with the Domino Project, um, put out a lot of small books under the Domino Project a few years back. Uh, with digital sales, your book length is not defined by how big your spine is. And that's why traditional publishers uh, favor longer books. So for a nonfiction book, for example, they'd be expecting 60 to 80,000 words because the size of the spine is important in a bookstore. Whereas on Amazon or Kobo or iBooks or any of Barnes & Noble, uh, you know, you see that cover and they're all the same size. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how big your spine is. So one of my best-selling nonfiction books, How to Make a Living with Your Writing, that's only 27,000 words. And that actually doesn't take very long, especially if you use a technique like dictation and then an editor you can write a book like that pretty fast, or you could do a short story. So I have quite, I'm about to put a short story up maybe even this afternoon, uh, which is, what is it about 3000 words? Um, and I'll just put that up for 99 cents. Uh, it's got a cover on, you know, you can even get free covers at a site like canva.com, you know, for a, a short story. I had mine professionally mm -hmm. designed, but if you, you know, a short story, you might not want to spend any money uh, on it. But as you say, you can test it out. So someone like Hugh Howey, who people might have heard of, uh, who had a massive hit with Wool. He's an indie author. Uh, he, um, he put out a number of novellas in different genres and then saw like a first in series novella novella, like an episode, like a TV show episode. And then the one that took off, which was Wool, he then wrote subsequent novellas and then put it in an, a kind of a box set. And then that got a um, massive book deal, Ridley Scott option, the rights, all as an indie author. So the, you're right about testing the market. Um, I do, I mean, I never have done sort of uh, hidden anything, uh, but I can see why it would be important. And, and for Penny Appleton, the reason to do a pen name when you're co-writing, I think it can be just quite useful. It's kind of, again, another business. Some authors I know set up separate businesses for their pen names, um, you know, that type of thing. So again, it's thinking much further into the future. Uh, how do you want your life to look in sort of five to 10 years time? Uh, you know, how do you want to be making a living and, and what are you going to build uh, along the way? That's a really interesting observation about the uh, the size of the, the size of a spine of the book in the bookstore that that I hadn't even thought of that. But then there's also certain economics of you know, what does it cost to print a book and how big does it have to be before somebody's willing to pay this price. There's all these economics in traditional publishing that I mean that's one of the things that I've discovered in in my journey was I felt pressure to uh, make the book a certain length. Y you hear people over and over. over uh, you hear people very often say, oh, all the nonfiction books are the same. It's just a bunch of stories and a bunch of filler and not that much useful information. Part of that is because of these economics of traditional publishing. But when you're indie publishing, you can make the book any length you want. My latest book is is 25,000 words. So this digital publishing, indie publishing revolution is, is really kind of changing the idea of what is a book. You know, in, in some ways, the the Kindle is, is really a... Um, it's like a paid web browser where the authors actually get paid instead of having to have ads in your face all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. And we should make it clear that, um, you know, you public, you can, and you should publish in print as an indie author. So uh, you can use create space, which is Amazon's own or KDP print. So just on the KDP dashboard, uh, you can use Ingram spark. If you want, you can even do hardbacks. Now print on demand means that you upload the files. And then when somebody orders a book, so if you order one of my print books right now, one copy will be printed near where you live and it will be shipped to you uh, directly. I never see that book. Uh, I just get the money. <laughs> and it just makes it makes it absolutely magic. I mean, it really does. Print on demand yeah. changed my life. And what's so cool with uh, what we can do as indies as well. So I do uh, workbook editions of my nonfiction. I do large print for my romance. Uh, you know, you can do different products. As I, as I said, like hardbacks, you do paperbacks, different sizes. So a 25,000 word book, I hope you've done a print edition of that. Oh, yeah, print edition, I've done the audible version. Yeah, I've, I've definitely, yeah, the, the print edition is, yeah, you should definitely do that. I, however, I didn't hold myself to, oh, I need to do all these at the same time, which is another thing that uh, I feel like happens with traditional publishing. You feel like you have to have this big all at once launch 
And but since it was my first time, I had a lot of stuff to learn. So, you know, I did the yeah. Kindle version. A week later, the print version came out. Uh, in between those two, I read the uh, Audible version. And that gave me a chance to fix any issues there might have been in the Kindle version so that it was ready for the print version. You know, I just I just went about it uh, with a a long-term strategy than, than worrying about having some sort of giant spike that I would launch with. And that's exactly right. And that kind of, again, circles back to what we started with, the kind of the New York Times spike marketing approach versus the long-term career as a writer. So as you say, I mean, it's the backlist that makes the money. Uh, you know, my income from books so much of it is based on sales of older books, sales of print books from, you know, months ago, years ago that kind of keep coming in. And that kind of approach, I think that's the big difference between another big difference between traditional publishing and indie. So for traditional publishing uh, authors, they might get an advance. Um, these days, the advances are generally tiny, but, you know, let's say they get a couple of grand on signing, then they'll see, see some money when the book is accepted. So maybe another couple of grand. And then when the book is published might be two years later, they see it's a bit more money. And then they may not. And because the advance is against royalties, they may never see any more money. Uh, whereas for indies, the money is a lot smaller, but it's every month. So if I look at how much, um, you know, so you have to have a longer time period. So do you want 5,000 upfront now or 5,003 chunks over three years? Or do you want, you know, $100 or $200 a month for the rest of your life and 70 years after you die, because that's the life of copyright. So this is the thing. And this is, again, for me, why fiction is such an amazing business model, because one of the issues with nonfiction is you have to keep updating it. Whereas mm -hmm. with fiction, you write that book, it's going to make you money for a blooming long time. <laughs> it's just absolutely magic. And just I have one more tip as well around uh, digital products. So box sets, uh, if people, so I mentioned these earlier, but box sets are completely magic. So this is where you put multiple multiple books into the same ebook, print book, or and or audio book. So what I do, and box sets are like, say, three books in one. And there's a completely separate market for box sets. Uh, it's just amazing. So you might make, you know, you put them together and sell them at a slight discount and you'll sell loads of those. And I have them in ebook print and in audiobook. And, and big tip for audiobook, the audiobook box set looks like an amazing deal when someone has an audible credit. They're like, wow, this is amazing. So I sell a lot of audiobook box sets. Joanna Penn, this has been such an amazing conversation. There's, there's so much to learn in publishing, especially being an indie publisher. So I really encourage our listeners to go listen to your podcast, The Creative Pen, uh, and you have so many other resources on your, your website. Is there any other places you'd like for, for people to, uh, to find more of you? Well, um, Successful Self-Publishing is actually a free ebook. It's available on all the um, online stores. So if people want to sort of find out all the nitty gritty details, then check that out. But yes, uh, otherwise come over to the podcast, The Creative Pen, or ask me a question on Twitter at The Creative Pen. Joanna, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, David. Is Love Your Work helping inspire you to pursue the life and work that you love? If so, I could really use your help. This show takes work and it takes money to make. To keep making the show and to keep it free for everyone, it needs your support. Besides subscribing and reviewing the show, there's one big thing you can do to help, and that is to donate. I work to make this show nourishing and thoughtful in an economy that's all about grabbing attention. This is not the short route to success. If you believe in Love Your Work's message of living a balanced life and finding fulfilling work, please join Love Your Work Elite, hosted on Patreon. Patreon is a platform that lets you support creators like me, vote with your dollars, and keep Love Your Work going. You're going to get bonus content and a discount on Love Your Work merchandise. Learn more at lywelite.com. That's lywelite.com. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by top Love Your Work Elite members, such as Arif Akhtar. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is At Sea by Jarena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs> <laughs>